To celebrate 25 years of our digital leadership report, we're bringing you three short conversations focusing on three particular areas of concern within the technology industry. First of all, we're starting with people. And to help me do that, we've got two experts, CEO of Oxford Ionics, Dr. Chris Balance, and our Chief Transformation Officer from De Montfort University, Tracy Jessup. How are you both? Great to be here. Good, thanks. Enjoying our slightly unusual setup. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, the first question. The survey talks about the focus shifting from hiring or growing headcount to retaining and engaging those teams. Do you think that's fair? And what do you think teams are, what do you think people are looking for in this current environment? So I think it's incredibly sector dependent. And right. what's great is that many larger companies are starting to do exactly that which means for startups like myself and deep tech, we get to go, go harvesting people from all these wonderful different places. <laughs> I'm sure and in, and bati in particular, as we're growing so fast, as these other companies are just starting to either slow down the growth and people who are looking to have their career trajectory enhanced are starting to realize that now fast moving companies start to turn into a bit of a static beast. This yep. is then great places for companies who can offer fast career development to really get wonderful talent at very reasonable conditions. Is that concerning? to hear a hyper-growth startup talking about stealing that talent. Because I imagine, you know, as someone who works within a, a, the higher education institution, that, that is a slight concern. Yeah, well, not just as someone who works in a higher education setting. I think probably actually all businesses need to think about that, that there will be other people looking in, looking at your best people and thinking that they'd be quite good in their setting as well. So one of the things that I've tried to do sort of throughout my leadership when I was in government and still now, is think about how we can have a mixture, a mixture of growing our own, investing in skills and talent, because often in public sector settings, we actually forget about that. Um, we worry about it when people have already accepted perhaps Chris's offer, <laughs> rather than c giving people a career path and a trajectory that might be as much about developing their skills as it is about them changing jobs within our organization. Mm -hmm. And then the other part for me, I always say to people, if you come and tell me that you're leaving for your next great career step, your better job, I'll be sad for me, but I'll congratulate you. Whereas if you're leaving for something the same or something worse, then I need to think really carefully about what we've done wrong. So I don't think it's necessarily bad that you have churn. I think it's about that churn happening probably at the right time for you and the individual. So Tracy's thinking carefully about <laughs> why those people are leaving. Yeah. When you're taking them from some of these <laughs> organisations, why are they leaving? So typically, well, you know, obviously layoffs are great because the people who don't get laid off, the best people, now suddenly know that their institution doesn't have the loyalty towards them and they could be next. So whenever there's layoffs, there's always wonderful opportunities to go around uh, uh, speaking to people like this. But secondly, it is just about the growth. As you say, if you give people good opportunities to grow and you have open, honest conversations about growth, and also when you can't offer that growth and you can be honest and say, you know, the best option for you to grow the way you want to, we to go somewhere else, here's how we can support it. A, it means your team are open and honest with you about what they want to do next and you can have open and mature conversations about what that evolution of their career looks like, which allows you to prepare your organization and manage that growth. And what's best is then the best people who do want to stay and just want the opportunity there find a way of openly having conversations and working out how you can adjust things, typically with relatively small, easy to make accommodations in order to allow them to grow better and help the org better. But it's not surprising that the report talks about the level of demand for data engineers and software engineers increasing. But where are we going to find those professionals? Because they are some of the hardest to find. Absolutely. And this is all about having a really good mission. And we were talking about this just before we came on. You know, How can you offer the best possible mission to excite people? No one gets out of bed and said, I really want to optimize the click-through rate on that Facebook ad by 0.1% and have my team spend the next year doing that. We're saying you know, we're going to build the world's next transformational technology. That's something people get out of bed for. So the answer is, you know, where we find this talent is it's pretty readily at the moment. It's about connecting with the right people and finding the right pools of talent. But people are very happy to move from somewhere like Meta to a risky startup because of the mission. Obviously, you're not working for a risky startup, but you can offer them a sense of purpose and certainly working for a higher education institution. That's providing something that's vitally important. Does that, that message got through? Well, one of the things that I think is important for me in terms of De Montfort is the, that my job in and of itself is a commitment from Katie as our VC to, to the amount of innovation and change that we want to create. So within the sector, we're innovative and that's actually exciting. And I'm seeing coming through now in some of my appointments, people who want to work with us because they know we're committed to change. And the university sector is pretty well known actually for being quite slow 
to change. So I think we're standing out because of that. You've obviously got to deliver against it, but in the first year, we have been doing that. I think to your point around we're not going to pay meta salaries. No, we're absolutely not. Uh, and if I sort of look back to, to my time at Parliament, um, you know, any of the people that worked for me in, for instance, cybersecurity, they could have walked out and probably doubled their salary, actually, working for a bank in the city. And if that was really what they wanted to do, then being in Parliament wasn't the place for them. But what I could offer was an in incredibly exciting mission, to Chris's point, and actually really, really interesting work and very closely working with NCSC, GCHQ. Far more interesting, actually, than a lot of the things that they might do for that big salary. So things have got to be right. I think you've got to get the money right in the sense of it, if it's not going to do what people need at all, then they're not going to have any conversation with you. But then it's what else? What else sits around that? What, what does that package look like? Okay. You mentioned GCHQ. I'm going to refer to my notes to make sure I get the stats from the survey <laughs> right. But it talks about the skill shortage easing from 70% to 54% and cybersecurity dropping down the list. And for the first time in, in a number of years, actually out of the top three. Apparently, that's to focus on top line growth. Is that surprising? Do you know what? When you, when you shared that with me in advance, I really was surprised by it. And I wonder if it is more about, if you like, the other areas that people are finding harder rather than cybersecurity in and of itself becoming exponentially easier, if you see what I mean. I think uh, data is definitely an area where I feel that there really are skill shortages and there's lots of people going after the same pool of talent. Maybe on cyber, may, maybe that has eased a bit or perhaps wider conditions mean that, that people are staying longer in their current institution, I don't know. But I guess I suppose if I look at our trajectory, again, the university sector can be quite traditional and have traditional approaches to cybersecurity as well. Um, it's still a challenge to get across to that leadership, the, the type of things you need to put in place to remain ahead of the game on that, I think. So yeah. not, not eased off as far as I'm concerned. And definitely, I'd say we're still seeing the reverberations of people just moving geographically on how they work, doing more mm. remote working, doing more hybrid working. And that is definitely still causing people to move around, which then causes, causes more people to move around. And we're still seeing that ripple down through, you know, certainly places local to us. OK, let's pick up on that point, actually, because work from office policies would seem to be a barrier to diversity. There are some who've even claimed that uh, working from home full-time is morally wrong, which is an interesting stance to take. Given the need to broaden the appeal of the technology sector, is a return-to-office trend counterproductive and perhaps a bit short-sighted? In my context, we have managed to attract a broader pool of talent, really from the top down, by having more flexible policies about on-site v. off-site working. Now, we're a university. We're, we're all about being present in terms of our students and our campus, and that's hugely important. But that doesn't mean that I need all my team to be on-site five days a week. I, we're never going to move to a fully remote model. We're not going to sort of sell our campus and become the open university. But, you know, that flexibility has definitely helped. It attracted me to De Montfort. It has helped attract others as well. And it's, I think it's about balance. I think people, these debates get quite um, toxic because people say it's either in or it's out. And actually, the most successful companies are making a mixture work, is my view. I suppose yeah. it's unsurprising. There's a perhaps lack of responsibility from some of the leaders of those organisations then. Yeah, and there's certainly people who are just taking the lazy approaches of this is how I used to do it, this is how I've seen it done before, so this is how we're going to do it without being creative about it. So I'd say in one word, the answer is yes, right? And I completely agree with you. It's all about treating people like adults and actually working out what they need to do to do the job. So we have people who work hands-on hardware, they cannot work remote. We also have policies, and if they, if they need to work remote, they can. So all of our team has the option to do this, and if you treat people like adults and hold them to account, you know, you can set a talent bar there and just manage people to that, and it becomes a really very easy thing to do, where you accept clear expectations and then let people work however they need to do it. It's exactly the same for flexible working policies or working hours or core hours or anything like this. You need to be really clear what you want out and then work with people to work out how they're going to put that contribution in in order to get the output you need. But Chris, Tracy, thank you for taking the time out of your days, both travelling here to take part in this conversation. It's been really insightful, so... Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>